Right. Welcome back uh, from the coffee break. I hope you all got what you wanted. Right. The next uh, presentation that's coming up is already mentioned above here. Uh, it is the next generation of transcribers. Uh, as you know, we have uh, enabled transcriptions and annotations of historical documents for quite a while. And this is also the reason why we now have to renew uh, what we're doing. We have to work on transcribers. And we have users worldwide with millions of already processed pages. And of course, we want to keep this up, but we also want to do it in a better way. So now we want to make transcribers ready for the future. We want to make it more powerful and we want to make it more user friendly. And this is why I yeah, invite to the stage the people responsible for this. Andy Stauder is already here and the others will join later in the presentation as I've heard. Florian Stauder, Florian Krull, Felix Dietrich, Philipp Kahle, Fabian Hollaus, Sebastian Kuluto and the word is yours. The microphone is on. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is really one of the of the highlights of the conference here. Uh, we would like to uh, talk a little bit about where we are heading next, or what we are up to next, and what we are thinking about. Um, so I would li just like to to introduce uh, my colleagues here, really, uh, from the. Uh, mainly marketing and developing uh, development team, so it's rather uh, product management and uh, development. Uh, and I would just like to highlight a little bit uh, the most important uh, areas, the key areas that we will be focusing on in the next couple of months uh, and years. Uh, the first area here is that there will be more tech or that we will think about tech, technology more. Uh, for example, we are currently re-evaluating the core components of the tools uh, that we are bringing to you. So the technological basis. We will uh, take a web-only tra trajectory, so we're trying to simplify the whole uh, technological uh, foundation of what we are doing. Because, yeah, maintaining two uh, tools is a lot more work than maintaining only one and uh, we will try to bring the best possible user face to you that we can. Uh, we will uh, include new transformer-based uh, tech uh, recognition technology. So we've heard already uh, something, a little something about uh, transformers. So yeah, they will bring a new level, especially to out-of-the-box performance. So how much do I have to invest before I can recognize the text, how much training do I have to do. Um, yeah, then uh, we are trying to bring technological improvements to uh, large-scale applications, especially with our processing API and with the on-prem that I already alluded to earlier. We will have improved trainable layout recognition. This is very near and dear to our hearts, so really to enable you to identify the different parts of text and to basically contextualize them and to identify and identify them as what they are in terms of structure. So that's it for technology mainly, or what is uh, technology proper, you could say. Then the second very important item here um, is more social elements. So we would like to bring the community closer together and interface it and network it even more than we already have. One element here will be user profiles, so that you can present what am I working on, what are my, my interests, and that other people can see, okay, there's someone um, working on Church uh, Slavonic of the 12th century. Great, there are only five people in the world that do this. I'm one of them. I didn't know there was one right next door. Uh, yeah, we will uh, improve and uh, include more collaboration features so that crowdsourcing projects and citizen science projects will be easier to handle and more fun to do as well for the participants. Uh, Transcribers Learn will be a very interesting feature. So you will be able to train the users uh, in paleography with uh, Transcribers. We'll hear about this too. Okay, now uh, 
also in the social category, we will have an open beta program where you will be able to try out features before they, before they go live and to tell us what you think about them. Maybe they're rubbish, maybe they're excellent. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we will focus more on the topics of content uh, and search. And these are really the, the, the very <clears throat> big strategic goals that we are following because um, content and search and also going beyond that, uh, intelligent technologies that might uh, accomplish just what we heard about earlier in the panel discussion to make AI a part of the conversation. I mean, it's not going to be the, the fancy historical chatbot in, in the next one or two years probably that will, um, yeah, <clears throat> that will replace historians. We're uh, light years away from that. Maybe it's not even happening anytime uh, in the future. But we will try to make everything more intelligent and to uh, bring the content and what's really interesting in the documents more to the users. And this includes researchers and the general public uh, equally. Uh, one first small step here is uh, read and search as a CMS. So you will be able to set up your own read and search as opposed to uh, having to go to one of our developers and having them set it up for you. And federated search will be a very big topic too. So bringing uh, read and search uh, instances together and being able to search across several read and search websites. So uh, yeah, uh, I'll hand over now to the team. And uh, next up is Florian or Flo, as most of you know him, and he will be talking about the web and what we have in mind for it. Thank you very much. So a warm welcome also from my side. I'm the guy that is bothering you all day with emails. Um, so I'm employed with marketing, but also with product management, and we'll talk a little bit about what is coming up to, with the move towards the web. Um, you might be familiar with this cute little guy, right? It's called the Wolpertinger. Every time you launch your expert client, you will see it on your screen. But there is some things going on. We have a second tool you can use to use Transcribus, which is called Transcribus Lite, and it's based on the web. And here you see what happened over the last few years. So it's only two years since we have Transcribus Lite now, but there is only even 55% of all users are already using Transcribus Lite. So it's there's definitely a tendency that goes towards the web. And that's also why we are focusing more in the web. It's just more convenient. It's just you launch your browser, you can go into Transcribus Lite, and then you have the features there. So we basically went from the left side, from the expert client, to the right side, to Transcribus Lite. Over the last two years, we have both of them now. You might ask, is this it? Some will scream, yeah, please keep, keep the expert client. I can feel you. I can really feel you. It is a tool that has been proven to work very well over the last few years. So it has been developed now. We have heard almost 10 years old now, and Transcribus Lite is only two years now. So it's quite young. But what we want to do is to bring both worlds together. So having two of those tools is kind of expensive in, time, in terms of maintenance, in terms of time. You need to spend a lot of um, resources on both of the tools, but they are basically doing the same, right? You can do your text transcription um, with transcribers and a lot of other things. Um, but what we are trying to do is to bring the, the, together the best of two worlds. So in the transcribers expert client, there are many, many features. There's like a saying in the team, nobody knows them all. So <laughs> there's so many features that not even our proficient experts in the team know all of the features. It's quite robust. It's tried and trusted, so a lot of users, especially the power users, those users that process really large amounts of, of pages, use the expert client. And it has a nice little 90s feeling when you have all those little buttons in that gray interface. Um, but on the other hand, we have Transcribus Lite. So it is rather quick. You can quickly uh, access it via your browser. 
and we hope that it's more intuitive, but we're not there yet, we know that. And it's also platform independent, what is really important, because just having the expert client to work on kind of a lot of different systems is a little bit tricky, as you might tell, and you, as you might have encountered some Java problems during your work with, with the Transcribers expert client. And it's responsive. You can theoretically also work on your smartphone. So our plan is to have just one Transcribus. It's called Transcribus, and that's what it's about. And we are moving towards that. It will be in the web, certainly. Um, we are trying to make it simple and powerful. So combining the really strong power of the expert client with the simpleness of Transcribus Lite. That's what we are trying and focusing on during the last weeks and the next months to come where we will be working on this. We will focus to build a really easy user interface, but try to bring as many features as possible at the right time. So you don't need like, I don't know, 70, 80 buttons at the same time when you really just want to do one thing. So that's certainly one of the focuses here. And we want to empathize the important things. For instance, the models. Like the models are kind of hidden. Of course you find them also in the expert client, but we will give them more space so you can also share your models, that you can um, have your unknown page for your models. You have them for the public models now, but it's more important to really showcase all your work because in those models there's a lot of work going in. We want to try to make workflows as fluent as possible, so we try to focus really on workflows. Where does a user start? How do they work? What is the next step they are probably trying to take? But we won't forget the little thing, so maybe a little thing that is coming up, bookmarking. So you can bookmark your documents or your pages because when you leave your, your browser, it would be nice to just start at the same time or you want, just want to remember a page. But there's some more concrete things to come, and I will hand over to my colleague Florian now. We got a couple of those. Thanks, Flo. Um, yeah, I just want to give you some quick insights into the web development team, what we're we working on. So Johannes Kleine and Andrea Haider. And well, so first of all, uh, we're working on Transcubus Learn. So on the left side, you see how it should look like a little mock-up. Um, we have an image snippet with the text, uh, um, with the word we're, we're trying to learn or trying to guess. Uh, underlined and the context around this word where you can then check the word and see a little progress. So that's really, really helpful for courses um, which want to learn um, reading the old handwritings. And we try to implement uh, some of these features like setting and editing tasks, for example, for professors. Um, in which they can exactly choose the words, which are kind of really tricky or, or hard to read, or just randomly select them. And also, of course, the uh, owner of the task should be able to um, read the statistics, so which words were guessed or um, re read correctly from the group. And of course, they will be able to uh, establish and create learn groups, so everybody in the learn group can take part in these created tasks. As uh, Andy mentioned before, we're also working on a content man management system for read and search that will be fully integrated in Transcribus Slide. So it's not decoupled, but it's just integrated. So you can just look at your material um, in Transcribus Slide and see how it will look like as a read and search instance. So um, you can edit the, the transcription, uh, the, the project uh, description or uh, the citation and just make it available for everybody without any login or Transcribus account. So um, you also um, will have all the powerful search features such as tag search or full text search in this read and search instance. And as we heard before, um, Transcribus is your socio-technological -techn tool, so we try to get you more involved into the development, and we try to use our Transcribus beta instance 
so that we can release new features as early as possible and have you and anybody who wants to participate in, uh, in testing and giving us feedback on how to improve certain features and how you use these features uh, in your process and in your work. So we will try to release uh, new features weekly and then um, have more stable releases which will come out probably every two or three months. And this is because we want to um, have you as a community to give us more insight in what features are really um, important to you and which should be uh, in Transcribus. And with this, I hand over to my colleague, Philip Kahle, who will talk about the processing API. Thanks, Florian. Um, as you said, I, I want to talk about some news from the API apartment today. Um, so, um, some of you might already know that the Transcribus platform exposes an HTTP API since the beginning. Uh, it's essentially what our user interfaces, the expert client and light use to accomplish things on our servers. It provides all the, the means to um, import data, accessing collections, man man managing documents in them, updating transcriptions, starting the various tools, and finally exporting the data. Um, but now consider this use case. You have your own editing pipeline set up in your systems and want to employ our handwriting recognition in the process. With this old classic API, you would need to handle all the different requests to our servers from import to organizing the data, starting the tools, um, and finally exporting the format you need. All of this is a complex protocol of requests that needs to be implemented in your tool. And we often saw in, um, in the past that this becomes very cumbersome and requires a lot of effort to get right. So um, one example where this came up in the recent past was the Enrich, Enrich Europeana Plus project. Uh, where the development was also co-funded, um, where it was about to integrate our handwriting recognition in the Transcribathon platform. So we uh, thought about those pain points we had identified and tr tried to uh, t address them in the development of this Metagrapho API. Um, first, we tried to boil down all the requests required for this to a minimum. Uh, a simple image in and text and layout out workflow. Uh, no con document collection management is needed for this, and as uh, the data does not have to be served to user interfaces, we also could get rid of the uh, persistent storage of image data. Um, as a starting point for developers, we added uh, documentation according to Open API specification and a Swagger UI that lets you try out all the requests in your browser. Um, so no one has to figure out how all the bits and pieces come together by themselves. And nevertheless, you have all your uh, custom-trained models available using this API, and also the vast number of public models from our website is accessible. Um, to give you an idea of the workflow with this new API, let's go quickly over it. After authenticating to our account service, all the data for processing one image file is submitted in a single request. Uh, the, the image can be either encoded into the request data or if your images are already online, you can pass in a URL and our systems will fetch it from there. Optionally, you can also add layout information like regions or regions and lines if you have your own analysis tool set up. Um, this also allows to select a region of interest that has to be proce processed. Um, finally, you need some configuration to tell our systems what to do with the image. This is specifically a text recognition model ID and optionally some parameters to tweak the layout detection. The response will contain a process ID, which can be used to pull the status of the processing, just as you know it from the old API for, with the jobs. And the final response contains the detected layout elements and the recognized text, or in case you passed in layout information, the missing elements will be enriched in there. The standard output is now a simplified JSON format, so you don't have to fiddle with the details of the page XML format. In case your tools need this, 
format, uh, we have endpoints available for fetching also page XML and I to XML. In the backend, all this is accomplished with an enhanced uh, tr transcribus job system, meaning you can submit a sequence of images and they will, will be processed in parallel as processing slots are available. We also offer reserved resources for this, so something we call fast lane, um, meaning you have a specific amount of slots reserved for your user account and your processing also takes place in, at times where our systems are under high load. <coughs> To give you an idea of what this API can do in terms of, terms of throughput, we measured the system with the validation set uh, of our German current writing model. Actually, we did a lot of tests, but I took this here for an example. Um, and we came down to a processing time of 15 seconds in average per image for this data set. Uh, from these tests, we derived an average throughput per day using a f um, three reserved processing slots of five to 10,000 images per day, depending on your material. What's up next for this API? We will add support for applying your own custom trained layout line detection and layout detection layout analysis models in the near future. And we are proud that this is already used in various applications besides our own Transcribers AI tool, where you can try out HDR in your browser. It is already used in the DocWiz platform by content conver conversion specialists, and, the Go and Gobi by Entranda, both of which are some of our early adopters, and I want to thank them for their valuable input at this point. Also coming up next is the European Transcriber Fund platform that will uh, Transcribers handwriting recognition using this API soon. And more to come, hopefully soon. Thank you very much. And uh, now my colleague Sebastian Colotto will take over and give you some ideas what the on-premises uh, solution means. It is working. Okay. So. Hi to all, um, as Philip already mentioned, my name is Sebastian Coluto, uh, and I'm one of the uh, senior software engineers here at the, um, at the Transcribos team. So I've been basically part of the team since uh, the beginning of the first project, which was in 2013. Um, yeah, in the next few minutes, I'm going to present you uh, our current and, and future development of the on-premise solutions for Transcribos. Uh, so first of all, I want to really to make clear what on-premise actually means. So basically, it's, it's just the installation of the read co-op or transcribo software on the local machines of a client, so as the name suggests, on their premises. Um, and this can be needed due to several reasons. Um, first of all, and this is maybe the most common one, um, in our context, it becomes necessary when the data, uh, that is, the document images in our case, cannot leave the customer premises due to uh, data privacy issues. For example, when there's uh, sensitive information uh, like patient data involved. Uh, another reason, on the other hand, may be that um, uh, you would want to make use of your, your own hardware or uh, the hardware of the, of the customers, like EG, a computing cluster. And um, using several on-premise worker machines, you could thus um, relieve the central transcribers workers from doing all the heavy lifting during the training and the recognition itself. So basically, I've divided my talk into three parts. First of all, I want to introduce you to the existing on-premise solution, which we have uh, developed for, our, um, for a customer. And secondly, I'm going to give you a broad overview of the architecture we have in mind for not only our next-gen on-premise solution, but also the next-gen of the Transcribus backend in general. That is a, a microservice architecture. And in the last part of my talk, um, I will outline our concrete plans for the implementation of this architecture both in the near future and in the long run. So, so our first setup of an on-premise solution was done last year in 2021 for the state archive of uh, the Canton of Zürich. And the goal here was the setup of an HDR system that recognizes some thousand uh, of images 
that uh, could not leave the house due to privacy issues as well, were images containing uh, sensitive medical diagnosis from, from patients. Um, we basically settled for an easier solution, a simpler solution. We got SSH access to one of the um, local machines, which is basic, was basically just a regular mid-range desktop PC uh, with a consumer graphic card that had six gigabytes of virtual memory and uh, was QD10 compatible. Um, also, it has uh, the Ubuntu 20 uh, uh, operating system installed. And the uh, software we set up on the machine was uh, the baseline detection, basically, using the default model, as well as the HDR recognition and training, both based on the, on the PyLi engine. And um, all of the software could be accessed using Linux shell scripts. And the files to be processed had to be copied to the local file system, where, each, where they could be accessed and processed by our scripts. And it was also possible to use one of our pre-trained public models, which in this case was just copied to the local machine. Uh, and in addition, uh, the State's Archive of Zurich were using the expert client in its local mode uh, to create ground truth data uh, locally for training their own models. Um, however, the user interface could not be used um, to start the actual training or recognition processes themselves. Uh, those had to be started using the console scripts instead. So, although this simple approach is very straightforward and has its advantages, there are, are some obvious problems to it, um, which we are currently working on. So, first of all, and this is more of a problem on our side, basically, uh, there was no page counting mechanism or any other sort of restriction on the processing integrated. So, it was only possible to offer kind of a, a flat rate or fair use solution uh, to a customer based pretty much on a, on a mutual agreement that the software would not be used outside of the specific project it was purchased for. So to overcome those problems, we will work towards a solution where our customers need to digitally sign both the hardware, that is uh, specifically the GPUs using the unique uh, universal identifiers, and also the models to be used with a private key at our site, and which then can in turn be unlocked using a public key on their premises. And this way we can ensure a bit more that the software is only used for the purposes of the, of the contract. But apart from those issues on a contractual level more, so to say, uh, the, the main technical problem in our regard is the lack of uh, so-called containerization. So this means that the, the on-premise solutions in the current state do have to be installed in every machine separately, including all its dependencies and also requiring a specific uh, operating system. Um, also, apart from the local mode of the expert client, there are no UIs like Transcribus Lite or Read and Search uh, available in the on-premise solution, and everything has to be run using console scripts, <coughs> which in turn requires someone uh, from the technical staff, more or less, to, to start all the, the processes. So, how to overcome those problems? And the answer is, um, and many of you may have already heard of that, uh, is microservices. So this is a really hot topic currently in computer science in general, and it's basically depicted uh, here on the right-hand side. Um, so this will be the, the future uh, architecture, not only for the on-premise uh, solution, but also for the Transcribus backend in general. Um, it is based on isolated microservices, each of which can then be developed and uh, deployed individually and which are communicating with each other. And the opposite of a, such a microservice architecture is called a monolith, which is here depicted on the left-hand side. Um, it's basically just one single database interacting with one business logic, which then in turn interacts with one or even more user interfaces. But this architecture leads to the problem that, first of all, changes to the monolithic uh, platform become increasingly complex as the platform grows, and thus the management overhead is growing over the years. In turn, the Microsoft, uh, microservices should be designed to be small and isolated, keeping them at a low management cost for the, for the team that is working on that service. But on the other hand, um, which can also be seen on this picture, there's also a downside to this approach, uh, which is really the increase in communication between the different isolated services, uh, which uh, obviously also gets larger, larger as, the system, as the system grows. However, this architecture, in our opinion, still has the advantage when it comes to deploying on-premise solutions, especially, as it enables us to only deploy certain services on the local machines of a customer, 
and not being forced uh, to install the whole platform, which is uh, infeasible in most of the situations. So next, I want to give you a short overview of the technologies that are usually involved when dealing with microservices. So first of all, the central unit of all of the microservice architectures is uh, called a container. So a container is essentially just a unit of software that contains all of the necessary code and its software dependencies. And uh, for that purpose, it utilizes the virtualization feature of the host operating system, which in its core, it's just the functionality of an operating system kernel to divide its resources into multiple user-defined spaces. <clears throat> And the most popular software for containerization currently around is certainly Docker. And I would even argue that it's one of the reasons why microservices have become so popular in recent years. Uh, but there are also alternative solutions like LXC containers or, or Podman. And then uh, secondly, you need to decide how the individual containers are going to communicate with each other. So the most straightforward way and default way to do this would be to create a web service with an API for each of the containers, um, which are then communicating with each other. But as this direct form of communication can become quite error prone for growing system also, there exist uh, more advanced solutions like um, uh, setting up a centralized message broker or a decentralized uh, service mesh that handles this crucial part in the architecture. And then finally, the last part in a microservice architecture would be that once you have decided about the containers and the communication between them, you would usually use an existing software solution for the orchestration, so-called, uh, of your microservices on your specific hardware. Um, and here, popular solutions include uh, Kubernetes, which is an open source software written in Go by Google, or the OpenShift project uh, maintained by Red Hat. So lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rough roadmap for our further development uh, of the on-premise software. So in a way, you could argue that our current on-premise solution is already kind of a Microsoft architecture, microservice architecture, because each tool, like the HDR training or recognition, is installed as separate tools and can be accessed with a command line interface, which serves as the input and output API. So here the task in the second phase here depicted would be on our, on our uh, part to uh, really clearly define the input and output of each service and then maybe create a web service interface for them to also handle the input and output from, from image services like uh, IIIF and then to create Docker images for them or using another so uh, software like LXC to encapsulate each service and make it easily installable on the premises of a customer. Uh, and then all services could be, um, as it is now, accessed by a command line interface or maybe also an adapted version of the expert client that could start the training and the recognition jobs. Um, however, in this stage, it may not be feasible to integrate all the, the, the job management and monitoring systems that are available in the, in, the, in the user interface currently. So as a rough timeline for this phase, uh, we have seen, we have foreseen the end of the year uh, or the beginning of next year as the deadline for a functional solution. Also due to the fact that, uh, that are also already some interested customers we are dealing with. So the interesting phase is then the, the third phase, which is the broader outlook to the on-premise implementation. And this is tightly connected to our plans for the next generation of the Transcribus backend in general. So as already mentioned earlier, the plan here would be to develop a system where each of the individual services could be installed individually on the premises of different customers and being able to communicate with each other. Um, so I think one of the first steps uh, for the on-premise solution here may be to integrate our current uh, web-based user interfaces into the system that is uh, Transcribus Lite or uh, maybe already the next-gen version of it. And afterwards, we have, we have to settle uh, afterwards, after we have settled for the core technologies we want to use, the task we build to, will be to containerize each of the different services that make up the Transcribus platform now, which is authentication, splitting up our current database into probably several database services, a job management system, 
uh, e.g. based on a message queue technology, um, but also the, the import, very important service for delivering and storing the files. So currently we have uh, custom software developed for that, but in the future we may support any sort of IIIF based image hosting services. But also additional services like the, the full text index, which is uh, obviously very important for read and search, will, be, uh, will need to be uh, containerized. So the goal would then really be to incrementally add those services and functionalities to the on-premise solution and our um, next-gen Transcribus backend as well in order to minimize the need for, for re-engineering. So this third phase is obviously a bit more vague and thus we cannot promise any concrete time frame for the implementation also because it, because it is uh, so tightly connected with the rethinking of our backend, which is a very large task obviously. So uh, I strongly believe, however, that we are able to implement and showcase the first demonstrator, including read and search and Transcribus Lite maybe by the end of next year, so maybe at the next year's Transcribus user conference. So with that said, uh, thanks for your attention and I will hand over to Felix Dietrich, who is uh, showcasing the next gen of the recognition engines. Okay, hello everyone. Um, yes, uh, my name is Felix. Uh, I've also been with the development team for uh, quite a few years now, actually. Uh, but uh, one or two years ago, I switched positions in the team, and my current job is to make sure that we do not lose track of current developments in the field of AI, and more particular, deep learning. And uh, yeah, the thing is, uh, keeping track of research can actually be quite difficult because as we already heard in uh, the keynote earlier, uh, it can sometimes be decades between the discovery of a new architecture and the time when this new architecture actually becomes practical. So in that regard, I have a slightly more technical presentation for you. Don't worry, I won't throw any equations around, but I do have some numbers for you. And yeah, these are basically the number of papers published every month uh, containing a certain keyword in the title. And as you can see here, we have, for example, CNN stands for Convolutional Neural Networks. That's the thing that completely revolutionized image processing, and it basically uh, made a lot of stuff easily possible that was impossible to do just 10 years ago. But the architecture itself is, as we already heard, uh, at least half a century old, but only in uh, late 2012, 2013, we can see that this actually started to take off. And today we have like uh, almost one and a half percent of all computer science papers published actually mention CNNs in the title. Uh, another big architecture is the recurrent neural network, or RNN for short, and in particular the LSTM, which is a certain variant of it. And uh, yes, this has also been around for a long time, I think 80s, 90s, something like that. And just like the CNN, it's only gained traction in the past few years. However, um, there are actually quite a few problems with RNNs. We will talk a little bit about them in a moment. And you can see they never quite took off as much as the CNNs did. And finally, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, we can actually say uh, it was not a bad idea of us to start investing into transformers because you can see in the last two years, this architecture has completely taken off. And even more interestingly, unlike the other methods, uh, the transformer architecture is actually completely new. This didn't exist before around 2017 and the, the uh, half a percent line there you can see is basically papers talking about some other kind of transformers all the time. And then once the, paper, once the first paper about transformer architectures was published, this has completely gone beyond everything. And today, more or less, uh, every big new development in the field of AI almost certainly has some kind of transformer behind it. 
Now, well, we already heard that transformers have for once completely taken over the field of natural language processing. Here's just another short overview of all the things that have come up in the past few years. We have seen uh, a very, very general uh, character word prediction models. We have seen uh, translation models. We have seen models that can uh, summarize things very well. And yeah, uh, the transformers basically enabled a huge amount of stuff that just was not possible even uh, I don't know, three or four years ago. And on the other hand, even more recently, the transformer has also overtaken the, the image processing world. Uh, here we can see the, the top models on the ImageNet competition. For those of you who don't know, ImageNet is basically a huge collection of hand-labeled images. I think it's a couple of millions of images labeled into thousands of classes. And yes, we can see that the, uh, beginning in 2013, the first uh, practical convolution networks have seen a lot of progress. But in the last one or two years, all the top models are either directly transformers or at least somehow based on transformers. And yes, for our sort of core technology, which is the handwritten text recognition, um, this is really important. So, here is just a, a short overview of how this is currently happening with the existing models, for example, with PyLayer. So you basically feed in an image of text. Uh, you have this convolutional network that basically sweeps over it. You, you uh, then feed these images into the recurrent networks to get a sort of language, uh, long-term sequence understanding. And then eventually you, you get sort of character probabilities out of that. Uh, the big issue here is that uh, Recurrent networks are very limited in the, in the size that you can train them uh, because they, they are not easily parallelizable. So the next, uh, the next iteration of a recurrent net always depends on the previous one. So if you want to uh, compute the whole sequence, you can only do it iteratively. And this, as I said, drastically limits their usefulness, and it's part of the reason why they never really took off. Although people have tried for years and years to make recurrent networks work, they came up with all sorts of tricks, and eventually someone discovered uh, one of these tricks is actually all you need. You don't need the recurrent network at all, and this is now the sort of simplified transformer architecture. So what happens in this new process is we basically take a very powerful vision model and a very powerful language model, and uh, we just feed in an image in certain patches. So this is, this is a key difference. Uh, before, images could sort of be arbitrarily sized, and now we work with images of fixed size, and we split them up into patches, and then we can generate a sequence, and then we feed that into a vision model. And uh, the great thing about this architecture is not just that it's uh, much uh, faster, much more easily parallelizable, so you can train much, much larger models. Uh, the second benefit is that you can actually train these vision and language models independently. So you could sort of take out this, this vision construct and, for example, train it on the ImageNet dataset just by uh, re refocusing the, the output layer on, on the image classes. Uh, spend, I don't know, a huge amount of resources creating a very good image recognition model. And you can do the same with the language model, for example, by training it to predict next characters or words in a huge uh, text data set like Wikipedia. And then you can go along and just take these two very powerful models. And for the handwritten text recognition engine, the only thing we really have to retrain is this layer in between the two models. Yes, so uh, just a little summary of how this works. It is a much simpler architecture. It is much more efficient. It allows us to train much larger models, which can also learn a lot more stuff. And uh, another key new feature compared to the old models, or the ones that we are currently using, is we are sort of getting rid of these uh, predefined character sets that you have to come up every time, and we sort of use uh, general purpose set of, of word tokens. Uh, I don't want to get into it too much in detail, but uh, let's just say it contains uh, 
at least for European language, almost every kind of special character and combination that you would need. So uh, with these new models, we will actually no longer have to deal with these model-dependent character sets. And if you ever tried to use a PyLayer model trained in one thing, a base model, and train it on a new data set, you probably know that this is not uh, very cool. Um, yes. Um, Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to announce that, yes, uh, the first of these uh, transformer handwritten text recognition models is actually already available in the platform. Uh, we've been working on it for over a year now and just recently started rolling it out to users. So uh, I guess over time I hope everyone will get a chance to try it out. And uh, our immediate goal for this first iteration of models was just to have one really huge general purpose model that was trained on all sorts of languages and writing styles and also on handwritten and printed text. And so far it has, contains at least six languages with uh, English, French and German being the most dominant ones, but we also have a couple other ones in there. And yes, uh, this kind of model is ideal for, for just trying out the recognition. For example, if you have a completely new collection of documents, you don't have any sort of expert pre-trained models, you can just see what kind of recognition can you maybe expect from that model. And uh, yes, on the other hand, you could also perfectly use this to create new ground truth, because when you don't have an uh, expert model, that means you probably also never have created any real ground truth. So you can go ahead and use this model, create a lot of uh, machine-generated ground truth that you then only have to correct, so you no longer have to do everything by yourself. And yes, this was only just a, a very first small taste of what's about to come. We are constantly working on this, and uh, for example, just recently we purchased some new hardware that will allow us to have uh, much faster recognition speeds using these transformer models, and in the near future, we hopefully also will be able to allow users to at least fine tune these models. So uh, the basic training, this is very uh, resource intensive. This, this takes weeks, even on our highest end machines. But uh, a fine tuning on a specific small cases of, of documents, that can actually be done in a reasonable time. And that is something that we hopefully will be able to allow in the future. And another thing, that will uh, happen definitely in the future is we will add more and more training data to this model, hope it can learn to generalize to even more languages. And we are also always working on improving the accuracy. So right now the model is uh, in direct comparison uh, at least as good as PyLiar with a specifically trained language model and it easily beats PyLiar alone. And in the future, we hope that with uh, further improvements to the architecture of the transformer, we hope the, to go even beyond that. And we are also always trying, of course, to improve the pre-processing and things like the layout recognition, which also really become important at this level because we have sort of reached uh, uh, almost the, the top of what's possible. If you, if you think back to the ImageNet competition uh, data set I showed you, um, the, the increase in the transformers over the convolutional nets, it was definitely there, but it's not much. So we are actually probably already dealing uh, very close to the areas um, of what is uh, even theoretically possible. And yeah, with that, I would like to give the word to Fabian, who will now talk a little bit more about our new forms of layout analysis. Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Fabian Hollhaus. I'm rather new to the team. Um, I'm working on computer vision, and for the last months I've worked on a new trainable layout analysis um, tool uh, for, yeah, for recognizing forms, or for doing layout analysis and table recognition. Um, yeah. So um, this um, new layout analysis will um, pretty soon come to Transcribos. Um, 
and contrary to um, the transformer thing that Felix talked about, this is not for general purpose. It's really designed um, to be trained on, on just a limited set of training data, so let's say 10, 10 pages with um, layout, analysis, layout um, annotations, and then to train this on this um, small ground truth set for your own documents. Um, it's based on an open source framework which is called um, Detectron 2. So this is, was released at the end of 2019. And the cool thing about this um, is that it um, allows to use different architectures, but also they have um, released um, cool models which can be easily, um, so you can, these models were trained on a large data set on natural images and you can easily fine tune it on, on document images for example. <clears throat> so this is definitely advantageous I would say. And one cool thing about this, so this, this framework allows for different kind of um, segmentations. So here we use segmentation for the layout analysis and Two of these um, segmentation types are one is um, semantic segmentation and the second one is instance segmentation and I will just um, briefly introduce what this means. So here you can see an example of semantic segmentation. So there we have an input image. Anyway, um, you have an input image and each pixel of this input image gets assigned, um, is labeled then as belonging to a certain class. For instance, we have here classes like persons or beach. Um, yeah, so this is this. But um, one thing is that if you have um, neighboring pixels that are belonging to the same class, like you say, you have um, persons which are standing, which are directly um, neighboring, then you cannot differentiate between the two, um, two, two objects which are belonging to the same, ob um, to the same class. So the current um, layout analysis tool in Transcribus, um, P2Pala, um, it uses this semantic segmentation. Um, yeah. And contrary to this is um, instance segmentation, um, which the new layout analysis makes heavily use of, um, where you just um, care about certain instances of classes. So in this case here, with a, we have just one class, or two classes, so the first one is the background, and the second one are here the persons. And the cool thing is now that you can differentiate between um, two objects, even if they belong to the same class, and also if they are neighboring. Um, yeah, and this is supported by this um, open source framework that I mentioned, Detecton 2. And yeah, so we are now using it for layout analysis. Um, so here you can see an example of the architecture. So it's based on a, a classical CNN architecture. Um, but still it works pretty well, I would say. Um, yeah. So basically it all um, depends on bounding boxes. So in the first, the bounding boxes are assigned to certain candidates of objects. And then these bounding boxes are further refined to um, segmentation masks. Um, so here you can now see um, an example of the output of the layout analysis. Um, so in, in the middle here, these white fields, they are anonymized. <laughs> and, um, but here we have an old document which is written in a tabular form. Um, and we trained it on, uh, I'm not sure, I think it was about 10 um, annotations. So this worked pretty well. So here you can see yellow just means regular words. Um, red means here teacher signs. And blue um, are digits. And as you can see, the, the framework is um, capable of segmenting these um, different kind of classes, even if they are um, belonging, if, even if they're directly neighboring, like here in the upper right, as you can see here. These two yellow bounding boxes, which are directly um, below, they are still um, still segmented into two different objects. So that's a nice thing. Um, 
And what you can also see here, so this green grid is the table that is found um, by the new layout analysis, um, and I will talk about this now in the next few slides. Um, so again, this table recognition um, is based on instance segmentation, and the cool thing for this is that you do not need any separators for this, or, or, I mean visual separators, like in, in a regular tab table, you have, let's say, a vertical line and a horizontal line, but if you do not have this, like in this example here, again, this is anonymized, um, then of course it's more difficult to um, differentiate between the different columns and the different rows. Um, and what we are now try, what we are now doing is um, we apply this um, instance segmentation. We train two different models. One is for rows, and you can see here an output for this. Um, so every color marks a different instance, and the other one is for columns. So this is here. So um, yeah. As you can see, maybe here, the third row from the bottom, this contains um, basically two text lines, but still it can be found. Um, yeah. And now we can use this information to do some very basic um, image processing to find the intersection between the rows and the columns. Um, and I will show you just some example how this works. So um, here we have two tables, and here you can see the output of the table recognition. And, um, oh, so, and here it's worth mentioning that um, only the vertical separators that are found here are the ones that were used for training, so the output is correct. And of course, this gives us a certain flexibility because we can say, yeah, we only want this column and neglect the other ones. So that's a nice thing, I would say. So in this case, I think it was decided that, let's say, the, the third column or something like this is the, is the name. And so we just want these certain type of columns. Um, here is a further example. Um, so now here we have um, vertical separators, um, but we also decided to um, to split the user virtual separator. So you can see here in the in the large column there are um, first names and last names, and we also um, trained the model to separate between these two um, names. And although um, the separation is not really visible. Um, or, yeah, it can be grouped, of course, but um, there is no vertical separator, so the model is capable of finding this um, vertical separator. <clears throat> and for the last example here, um, we have here some um, vertical separators, but no hori horizontal separators. And um, yeah, but we trained the model on these, um, so for. Of course, here the, the extraction of the rows is more difficult, and here you can see the, the result. So um, this works pretty good, I would say. So at the current stage, we are just um, using um, straight lines for separating between the rows and the columns. But yeah, so at least in the examples that I showed you, this is sufficient, I would say. So also in this example here, um, yeah. And that's it, so just for a um, short summary, um, the, the layout analysis is based on um, instance segmentation, and compared to the previous um, layout analysis, um, the, the output is more precisely, I would say, and especially in the case if you have um, very limited training data, so which can be attributed that we, to the fact that we have this um, detection tool framework, you have a very good, um, you have the pre-trained models, and you can, which are pretty good, I would say, and you just have to fine-tune them on your own data set. Um, so you fine-tune it on your own collections or your own documents, and for the table recognition, you also just provide the, um, an annotated table. Um, 
And so um, they, we then make use of the, of the page XML in order to train um, a row model and a model for columns. And this is then done in the table recognition part. And yeah, so this will then come soon to Transcribos. And that's it. Right. Thank you very much for this insightful and, well, quite techy presentation. Um, we now have a little bit more time for two or three questions. So if there are any, it would be cool if Sarah could hand you the microphone. No questions? Everybody waiting for the lunch? All right. Pardon? They're just blown away. They're just blown away. Okay, that's what Andy says. <laughs> right, okay, if there are no questions, then um, we've got one. <laughs> Do you want the microphone or don't you? hand this question over to the guys who do the development. What do you say? Go ahead. Hi, oh, we've got a microphone here. This is on now. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand, understood the question uh, correctly. Do you mean uh, an indexing function for uh, creating word lists, basically, indexes? Okay, so you mean by, uh, lists of the stuff that you tagged in the text, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, this is definitely valuable input. So we have no concrete plans to do this yet, but uh, I think we'll make a note of it and yeah, see what we can do because uh, if there's a, a concrete need for it, then we're definitely happy to yeah, think about it. Um, okay. Anemika says it's already possible uh, in, in the expert or for, yeah, yeah, for the tags, uh, for the tags, but not for, yeah, not for anywhere. You, you mean uh, only for tag material or for uh, any kind of word that you have not tagged, for example? For example, you might um, want to have a list of, uh, uh, or you want. We yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. With tags, yeah, that's true. It is, it is solved. Yeah, in in read and search, for example, you can also uh, display the tag lists there, and in Transcribus Lite, is it? It's it's not in there yet. Okay. So it's, is it limited to just read and search? Because I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, and it, it depends on the kind of tag that you're using. So it's not there for structured tags yet. Okay, are there any other, other questions? Dave. Not anymore? 
Okay, then we have a question there in the back. I'm coming to you. <laughs> Lunch. Yes. Would it be possible to use the API to score a single page ground truth against a load of models? Which is a question for the tech team. And a question for you specifically is if I run a single, if that's possible, and say I'm trying to score against 40 different models, what will be the implication for credits? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, how, do you, how do you mean score? You would like to... I'd like to... What we often do is we have a new text and we see if it works in any of the models that we have or in any of the public models. But if we can do that through the API, obviously it's a lot quicker. So you're thinking about, uh, yeah, having a test run with your, with your models. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not really sure. Mm. What does the tech team say? <laughs> Philip? Uh, this is something which at the moment needs to be done manually, I think, if I understood your question correctly. So you would have to try out the different models you think are good. We internally talked about this feature actually a lot, but at the moment it would require a lot of processing resources to really test all the different models against one page. So it's, it's useful to really make a selection of models and try them out. Of course, this is something we have on our list to th always think about uh, when it comes to overhauling things. Um, yeah. Uh, well, now you want to know how well a, a custom trained model works because a custom trained model can do better, especially in terms of um, uh, time performance because you want to be quick about uh, recognition too. So the transformers have not solved that uh, problem yet. Uh, and coming back to the second question, uh, what that means in terms of uh, credit consumption, uh, that would depend a little bit on what the feature really really looks like. If it's really just about scoring, then I imagine we, we can uh, implement a system that would be cheaper in terms of the per page price because you're basically interested in uh, will I be processing a lot of pages with this model? That's what it boils down to. And yeah, I think we would be willing to facilitate that. Uh, what, what you can use here, which, on, which is free of charge, is the sample document functionality. So you can crea create samples from your data which, where lines are picked randomly, and then you can run the processing on that uh, as, as many times as you want without paying credits. Okay, I think we're in a bit of a hurry, aren't we? We've got a new question. Here in the second row. Okay, let's do one <laughs> more very quick question, please. Um, one of the speakers told about uh, TR, HDR, so the transformer uh, models, and one of the slides said uh, it's now available in Transcribus to, to try. Um, where can I find it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yeah, it's, uh, you need to be on the list. <laughs> Short answer. I think we really need to get lunch yeah. going now, okay? I think we have to move on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>